Hi everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking to Beth Biggins, uh, Beth Biggins Raymer, Nathan Rutz, or Rutz. I bet I'm butchering everybody's name, but it comes from a good place. Daniel Keitzer and Ismail. And today we're going to be talking about the future of waste in Cleveland uh, and Cuyahoga County in general. Uh, we felt this conversation was important because each speaker and each organization experiences waste in their own way and they have an opportunity uh, to look at it as an input or an output and we're going to kind of question what that means and how they can make use of inputs as outputs outputs as inputs and the whole economy uh, as a whole uh, our conversation today is structured to help uh, help you as a viewer us as students uh, understand why sustainability makes sense in a competitive market setting uh, why not all outputs from an organization are useful you know sometimes trash although it is valuable uh, cannot effectively be used uh, recent initiatives to bolster circular economies in our area and recent initiatives in solid waste management we have a couple questions that we sent out to each panelist. And after our introductions, we're gonna hop right into that. Uh, so just for a couple minutes, let's start with introductions. Uh, Beth, can you please tell us about yourself and your organization? Thank you for having me. I am Beth Biggins Raymer. I'm the executive director for the Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District. We are the organization that um, is somewhat of an umbrella over all of the communities within Cuyahoga County. And um, we are a resource for businesses and residents both um, to support sustainable materials management and um, hopefully along the way reduce the impact waste has on our environment. Okay. Nathan, would you like to follow that up? Yeah, my name is Nathan Rutz. I'm director of soil at Rust Belt Riders Composting uh, and Tilth Soil. We um, started on bicycles picking up food scraps in 2014 and with two people. We are a worker-owned cooperative, and we think that the way we do things is just as important as what we do. Um, so we practice workplace democracy and horizontality, and we... Um, have am, some ambitious goals of uh, diverting about 20,000 tons of food scraps by 2025. And we make, and so we, we, we both haul from residents, we haul from businesses, and we make compost and potting soils, seedling mixes and raised bed mixes with that compost and other ingredients. Okay. Ismail, could you follow that up? Yeah, sure. Ismail Samad from Loiter in East Cleveland. Um, I am, so I, I am also a chef, um, restaurant owner and kind of other stuff. Food waste has been part of my life for a while. And I, Loiter is a nonprofit organization that's focused on a citywide effort to create, you know, a, a closed loop food system within the city of East Cleveland. And so we're deploying, uh, you know, all of our resources, connections and efforts necessary to have one of the most sustainable cities in the state of Ohio and the nation. And we're beginning from the beginning of a place that is a poster style poster child of what extraction looks like when you have people of power who continue to deliver unprincipled decisions for 95 percent population of black folks that'll be it'll be interesting to hear your answers to the questions that we set out <laughs> and lastly but not least daniel please introduce yourself yeah, hey everyone. Uh, Daniel Keitzer, uh, presently Director of Ecosystem Growth at a company called Reaply. Uh, we're a technology company uh, helping provide solutions uh, for companies and organizations to get involved in the circular economy. Uh, I've been in the sustainability space since 2010 uh, in, in a variety of different roles on the nonprofit and for profit side of things, um, but really gravitated to this circular economy space uh, and particularly how technology can help us grow and scale uh, circular economies faster and more efficiently and more equitably. 
Um, so yeah, great to, to join you all today and really excited about the discussion. He's a little quiet, but arguably the most important person on here. So thank you. Uh, not, not, not to take away from anybody else, but let's do hop in these questions. Uh, the first question, uh, this question is directed towards the Rust Belt riders and loiter. How does your business reuse what would be a waste stream or an input and output uh, for a market advantage? Uh, let's go ahead and start with Nathan. Ours is pretty obvious. We pick up food scraps that would often be landfilled and we make compost with them. Okay, okay. Now, if we could expand just a little bit on that answer. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I mean, so the state of Ohio landfills about 1.2 million tons of food every single year. Um, okay. So that's a, a, a appalling volume of food that is um, just straight up getting landfilled. And in the landfill, it's there are all sorts of problems because it's an anaerobic environment, so it creates methane, which is a much worse greenhouse gas than CO2 is. So you'd actually be better off burning the food scraps than landfilling them. Um, but we can do even better than that, which is by combining them with wood chips and leaves and other um, squandered resources, which we have in large quantities, um, particularly in the fall around here, we can make compost, which stabilizes nutrients, which builds populations of microorganisms, um, and which is a, a really nice general lozenge for soil. Um, so uh, for all of our, our in, in, you know, I live on the east side of Cleveland, not in East Cleveland, but I have high lead in my soil, and that's how I got started on this journey, actually, is because my backyard has high lead. I sent off, I, mean, I was like, all right, I got a house, I got a yard, cool. Um, that I could afford and oh there's high lead in the soil um wow and so um there is actually some really good studies going on at Ohio State Worcester which is OSU's main agricultural campus um with Dr. Larry Phelan and a few others um looking at what happens to the heavy metals and uh organic contaminants by organic contaminants I mean carbon-based contaminants uh, in soil in city soils went with the application of composts um and they've found that there's like huge benefit uh, to adding compost to urban soils in terms of um, doing th lowering the, the concentrations of heavy metals and degrading, in some cases, uh, the, the organic contaminants like, you know, gasoline and other stuff like that. Um, That's fascinating. And, yeah. you, and you're doing the director of soil. How many schools yeah. do you generally work with? Like, so how many products do we make? Yeah. Um, so we have our, our base compost, which is one. And then we have we make uh, four or five other um, specialty potting mixes. So we make a seed starting mix for vegetable seedlings. We make a raised bed mix. We make a house plant mix that has, we add nematodes that parasitize fungus gnats because fungus gnats are one of the most annoying things about house plants. Um, and we make a specialty mix for cannabis. Um, and then, so our, our main customer segments are home gardeners, organic, certified and uncertified organic vegetable growers, and weed growers. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I would love to ask more questions about that. Ismail, could you please go before I come back and, and get us off track? <laughs> I was going to get off track, I guess. I guess <laughs> you, must have, you must have really read my bio. So, no, I... Um, yeah, so I think so for us, like I said, like we're start we're starting from a ground zero reality here in East Cleveland, right? You're starting with divestment that is like, you know, like again, like Nathan said, like you say what he you you take what he mentioned and you put it into an actual municipality that doesn't have institutions to come and save the day with economics. So meaning you've got to create, you know, um, an economic base from the beginning when you've got disinvestment, you've got GE leaving, you've got Cleveland Clinic leaving, you've got, you know, Case leaving, you've got the, the, the barrier at the bridge and people not wanting to intentionally put um, large scale investment into a city that's probably about $20 million in the red every year. So you have to create an economic base. So what we're doing is starting right with compost. So you say, okay, right now it's currently, you look at the charter, 
So we're working with uh, the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic to come up with an entire citywide food plan for the city of East Cleveland. And that's starting with the fact that East Cleveland is currently illegal to, to, uh, to compost in East Cleveland. So you have to put that on the legislative floor to actually begin to create these things that other cities can do because the, the realities are just so different when you're talking about a democratic process to create things. And so you have to marry in some of the realities of what disinvestment does, what feckless leadership does, what economic uh, depletion does. Um, and so we're starting with a couple of things. We purchased um, uh, with a, a partner of ours, Food Depot to Health. Uh, we purchased uh, a fermented food company called Wake Robin Foods that's been um, recovering surplus foods from farmers for the last nine years. Um, and so we do about nine SKUs of ferments um at the same time we're opening a cafe and we're growing on raised beds um uh perennials and other things uh that we can actually put into the cafe that we're opening on euclid avenue to again keep the circular economy staying and also keeping the um the dollar within the community too and so we can become the the anchors of creating a seven generation city and, and so that's kind of like really what we're what we're working with in east cleveland right now um and it starts with land control. We're purchasing as many plots as we can. It's like, thank you for disinvesting in East Cleveland. I love the barrier to entry is low. Um, so we're taking whatever resources we can to actually create the world of, of sustainability, not just um, economically, but also as it relates to the ecosystem that we're trying to create. That is first and foremost, a lot. And secondly, <laughs> very, very important. Uh, he's a little underspoken, soft-spoken about it, but in short, he's talking about controlling the entire supply chain vertically uh, so that he can get products created in a place that doesn't have a lot um, to a table or a cafe and then recycled, all, all watching and keeping track of the whole thing. And that is, that is very incredible. That's... Uh, you know, from a supply chain management point of view, that's absolutely the case study you want to you want to look at. So thank you for your work. Yeah, no, um, thank you. And if we can, I'd like to move to the second half of your questions. Um, continuing on, uh, please speak to the many ways that your organization interacts with waste and tries to eliminate it, and some of the challenges that you have with eliminating it. Uh, Nathan, we'll start with you, but you mentioned a little bit about what wasn't necessarily wish cycling so much as just general people don't care. Could you speak to that? Well, yeah, that's a good question. So um, we have residential service and the people that pay us to drop off their food scraps are excellent because they're highly motivated. I mean, they're so motivated, they're willing to pay us to take their food scraps. Um, so those people are, are really good. They There is some wish cycling or like, oh, can I compost this? And I'm like, no, you may not compost that. Um, and <clears throat> we have a big internal like difficulty among ourselves in um, taking compostable plastics. So compostable plastics are a thing. Um, they're usually made out of something, corn somehow or sugarcane big ass. Um, and uh, the, any compost with compostable plastics in it is not allowed in certified organic production. Um, also, and for this for a variety of reasons, um, some of which are good, some of which, yeah, actually I think they're all good because we don't actually know what the decomposition products long-term are of bioplastics, of compostable plastics. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean the molecules aren't still around. We don't really know what those molecules are doing in the environment. Also, um, there are a lot of things that are labeled as compostable plastics that are coated in PFAS. You've probably heard about that. Those, those have been getting a lot more press lately, those fluorinated compounds, which are really good at repelling water, but also really good at suppressing your immune system. Um, forever chemicals. Yeah, they're frequently referred to as forever chemicals. And so anything, any like fiber bowl that resists water and grease, guess what? PFAS. Um, so um, that's a total bummer. Um, but the, the question in, so, and then, and then it's like the post consumer food scrap pickup is in a place where not everybody themselves is personally bought it, bought into it is a huge challenge, especially if you can control everything in the cafeteria. Um, like we, we, we worked with this boarding school for a while where they, it was, it's just, I mean, 
is a, a, a rich person's boarding school. Um, and they had staff they that would scrape the plates, scrape the trays. And so that was really clean stuff. That was, that was, I, I was happy to take that stuff. Um, but at other places where, uh, there's no people bring their lunches or they also have trash, you know, like, like ketchup packets. Um, uh, I despise really- ketchup packets. Um, that's those just you know ruin your day as a composter but then we ourselves make trash all the time i mean we use plastic we drive fossil fuel vehicles uh we're we're burning up ti- like grinding tires creating microplastics uh we we put things in bags um unfortunately and those bags are made out of plastic um supposedly they could be recycled but you know how many people do that and we receive things in packaging um do you, uh, do you ever, by chance, um, receive foods that are maybe compostable, um, but maybe shouldn't go to you? Like they should be eaten by humans. Well, uh, that's also a good point. How many, how much of your products are actually completely fine, and they get composted for no reason? So uh, our biggest single customer is the Heinen's grocery store chain. Um, We pick up from every one of their locations several times a week. And I would say 20% of the stuff we get from them is definitely edible. Still good. Absolutely. This time of year, refrigerator season, you can just go in and grocery shop from Garbaggio's. We do it all the time. Is there there any thought? to get to a point where you can make that food available again. Oh Are man. On um, that? Is that- we, we, so in, in large scale, not easily. Um, we would love to, um, but the, we're not well set up for that currently. I mean, I'd say that's definitely aspirational. Um, but part of the problem is, you know, it's mixed. Like the stuff that's good and not good is all mixed together, and you, yeah, you have to be willing to pick through stuff that's covered with the scraps of other stuff. And you know, that's pretty much fine for like onions and thick skin citrus fruits. But you know, you don't really want to eat a tomato that's got like a bunch of slop on it or had slop on it. Yeah, sure. If it's, especially if somebody who does vegan, like sloppy joe. But um, my bad. Is my if you could answer that half of the question, um, what kind of waste do you experience? And do you experience waste that can't be reused? Oh, you're on mute. I think that's that. So, so yeah, I think, so as I mentioned before, with the purchase of Wake Robin, we're able to actually secure product. Um, we're able to secure products um, from our production center. So we're getting things that the the farmer would not be, um, that may be overgrowth or maybe ugly stuff or some stuff that is misshapen. Um, We then process it. And of course we have shrink within the process and we put it into the compost and we're growing our own compost business. So that's an entire closed loop right there. Uh, We use glass. Uh, and we're about to we, we're about to start a whole campaign of re, of capturing the glass that we actually produce the products and to have a local site in East Cleveland. So that the line of 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 fermented foods will be an entire closed loop. Aside from the fact that when we have a meeting, we're going to be on a Zoom call, which is like super wasteful because it's using extractive ores and, and the, like like Zach said, like we can't afford some of this stuff, which is super. Um, bad um, to think about when you're, but with, but as far as like that line, we'll be able to say that it's it's pretty closed loop, um, and it will be even more once we kind of stand up our um, our East Cleveland operations. So right now we're on the west side from working on getting our processing and everything set up in East Cleveland, um, and so then anything from that, and you start, you know, they say begin with the end in mind. So the, if the if the idea is to actually create, you know, a, a zero waste community we're starting with a zero waste company and then you build up from that the foundation is there and the ethos is already set and then now the only thing you're working on is the the mentality of the people 
like again like if if and now the mentality our theory is mentality can change when economics change right you when you're voting at 10 percent and there's no economics here and you're not a part of the change of your community and there's some savior coming in um why would you change why would you be inv involved in the process of community building and, and civics so by by us leveraging the the communal work that we're doing um growing on side lots having them be a part of you know cast uh, advocating for the establishment of currently an illegal uh composting situation um having the side lots now being producers to tie into this business that we are going to be growing all of a sudden you get mutual benefit and everybody can now be attached to the growth of the community and so it's now you're economically incentivizing people to engage and you also are scaling up a business with sound investments from not just in not just um capital investments but also communal investments which is going to give you the social capital to build a community which is three and a half square miles which we believe a city that's three and a half square miles that you can now enact things you know on the legislation that actually creates a culture within the city i'm kind of a municipalist too so i mean i think that once you start to create a uh, an environment that can be very social and it gets on the floor to actually be what the admin what the administration or what um the legislation legislations decides to put in all of a sudden the judicial system begins to police differently as well and all of a sudden you're no longer you're not like criminalized or fined for not composting or recycling you actually are contributing to the economics of the city so i think it's all attached to like how small you be be begin and then how you can actually scale it up so it's not like i said it's like a blessing and a curse that East Cleveland is what it is, but that's just the reality of extraction. You gotta be, you gotta be realistic about when you live in an extractive uh, society. There's going to be a place of waste, and this is unfortunately the capture of of waste as it relates to um, investment and just kind of like the forgotten people and the forgotten land that's just as flooded with with um, the previous um, rise of, of, of an economy, which was attached to some tycoons that remember that we remember their names. And so to, to Nathan's um, point, um, all these businesses will be, you know, community owned and or employee owned. So we won't mean we won't remember my name. Right. So you remember then, you know, it won't be attached to some some wonderful tycoon that that stood up in an economic base. So now you're again, you're 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 building upon the ethos right from the beginning. So the argument is you have to find these entering suburbs and these these places that actually have the the, the 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 municipal power to stand up the systemic change that you need. If not, you're going to be in, you're going to be fighting with these institutional um, behemoths that have so much political power and so much reach that holds on to an extractive economy that continues to perpetuate the very things that we're going to fix. So anyway, so that's kind of how we think about it as a as a citywide plan um and so we kind of bake it in at every level as we can absolutely um i want to also open up and get conversation from daniel and beth but to highlight on the importance of what you just said um my question was a little bit about you know from a market point of view how do you know what is waste and what is not waste and what you're kind of saying is from almost a basic philosophical level, we're trying to build non-waste reproductive systems that extend politically as well as in your grocery store, uh, as well as throughout the entire life cycle of products, people and places, uh, which is almost a revolutionary rethinking of how we do capitalism itself. Uh, so I just wanna, highlight that that is a very important you were you were saying some very important things there um to go to the questions that we still have left uh, we're directing this question towards materials marketplace uh, um, your business is separated into two parts corporate and uh marketplace so at reapley uh, you have your corporate kind of sustainability, as well as the marketplace, which stretches nationally. I believe um, not every state has a materials marketplace, but many do. Uh, what are some of the top priorities for Reapley in the materials marketplace uh, kind of arena? And what are some of those top priorities in the um, corporate arena? 
Jeez. Yeah, yeah, happy to happy to dive into that. Is my audio a little louder now? I press some buttons. If you Does can it turn sound it just okay? a little bit more. Okay, let's. Uh, all right, how about now? Is that better? Anything? I, it's a little better. It's a little better. A little better. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll keep fiddling with That's it. Good. Okay. That's good. Nice. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, good. So so we so we work on as you said on the kind of these two sides, um, but all kind of following the same sort of principles around circular economy. So starting from the very, very top of you know, getting really large organizations, getting businesses to just buy less stuff, right? So, so buy less, use the stuff that you have more efficiently, use the stuff that you have longer, use it more effectively. Uh, and then when you're, you know, when you're done with that, like when you truly have exhausted using the things that you have around you, then let's think about how we put those things into the hands of somebody else who can keep it at its highest and best use for the longest amount of time possible and then go down the chain from there you know into uh, these lower tier uses so recycling things etc um and and so you know whether we're talking about a national materials marketplace or whether we're talking about doing this inside of a company like Google or a company like Target, um, it's still a part of that same that same principle. Um, and, and we and we approach it the exact same way. Um, and and so a lot of our like kind of more enterprise side of the business is around getting things visible inside of a big company, facilitating internal reuse of of assets and materials inside of a big company. And then when it gets to that point that they truly no longer can use this, building the ecosystem that can put this stuff into the highest value use um, as it moves into its next life. Um, that highest value use looks a lot different just depending on what it is that you're working with and what it is that uh, you're looking at. And we cover a very wide range of, of assets and materials here at Reapley. Um, but but we're always trying to to optimize our, our ecosystem to 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 keep things you know as high as they can be. Yeah. Um if I could try and paraphrase, if I were a salesman for Reapley, put myself in those shoes, it might almost sound like you go into these large, I'm sometimes extremely large corporate customers and you focus primarily or should i say first and foremost on getting rid of all of the um extraneous waste and then whatever is actually waste that's left that's what might go into your materials marketplace yeah it, it's kind of the that first stage of like uh, of prevention of waste right so so we i i never want to 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 make that determination that something is is waste or unneeded until I truly know that that we need to be bumping it down into you know, into those, these other categories. So um, so it's really going into a large company, finding all the stuff that they don't even know that they have um, and, and getting that stuff recirculating in more of a productive way. So in some. Excuse me. Um, in some cases, it's um, and maybe there's specific products that are difficult to handle, um, and you need very special materials or people to get rid of them. Is it a lot like product management, or I should say, project management on that side of the company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's where where we kind of make that transition into more of this like materials marketplace style of, of project and initiative. Um, and Could you go into the materials marketplace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so materials marketplace is uh, uh, an intentionally built network of business and organizations, incredibly diverse, you know, every kind of industry represented more or less. Um, and and it's designed to uh, to be that connector, to be that matchmaker between one business's waste stream in quotation marks uh, and another business's inputs. Um, and, and so in Ohio, with the Ohio materials marketplace, the types of materials that you see on the platform and in the program are very industrial focused. So like uh, very like large industrial waste streams coming out of big factories um, that we're trying to connect to other large industrial processes to 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 make use of it 
Um, but all of the, the kind of same themes that we've been hearing through this discussion still kind of sort of apply. Like if that initial process that's outputting materials doesn't respect them and isn't treating them right, isn't keeping things clean, doesn't you know, really care about where they're going next, that's going to make it so much harder to find that next use. Um, and, and so, you know, de just depending on like what you run into, how high you can go up on the ladder of, of how that stuff gets used in its next life, uh, can, it can really vary a lot. Um, but the, but the goal is to, to, again, you know, find reuse, find recycling, find kind of higher use, uh, uh, outlets for this stuff to go to. Um, and do that in a way that drives environmental impact and drives economic impact. Wow. Um, let me just read this question. It's also a lot. Um, how legislation around that area kind of impacted you lately? Um, I know that you work across many states. I know that I was first introduced through an oil factory. Um, but recently there have been bills out, there have been changes, Greta Tuttenberg, you know, a lot more visibility has been on the industry. Do you know about any recent legislation that's had an impact? Yeah, so so I, I track a, a lot of different pieces of, of legislation, both like more kind of waste management focused. Um, but but I, I think like probably some of the most exciting legislation that uh, is touching our space today uh, is more around like low carbon purchasing policy. Um, okay. So the, the on the federal level, the GSA has put out some new guidelines that uh, are encouraging purchasing of low carbon materials, so low embodied carbon materials. Um, a lot of that's in the construction and built environment space, a few other sectors, but uh, basically what that's saying is that if you're doing a big government project, you need to prioritize buying materials for that project that have a lower embodied carbon than they would traditionally have. For us in the reuse business, that's huge because oftentimes the best performing material from an embodied carbon perspective, is a material that's already been produced. It's something that's already around us. It's something that exists today that a company doesn't have to go out and purchase and, and, yeah, and manufacture brand new. Um, so, so that's really big for us. I think that's, uh, I, I think that's a really, really big push and I want to see more of that start to trickle down to the the state and local level as well and i think it will um but yeah then in addition to that um yeah just staying on built environment for a second uh, i love seeing a lot all the new momentum around like deconstruction policy uh and c and d uh policy that's that's starting to emerge now in places all around the country uh, i think that's going to really help some of those industries and some of that business uh, start to get going, um, and then ultimately are, build better markets. What are some of the challenges that you've been noticing in collecting materials? Because now anybody can't, I shouldn't say anybody can't get on the materials marketplace, but there is a screening process. Has it been in quality of people or quality of materials? Um, more, yeah, more around the types of businesses and organizations, just making sure that, um, that the materials marketplace is a program for businesses and organizations. So not for individuals, um, that's really just to, to kind of keep the, that level of, uh, of service and expectations when companies are doing transactions on the materials marketplace at a little higher level. So, um, you know, if you're. A General Motors, if you're a big company that's participating in the marketplace, you can have some comfort knowing that the other side of that transaction that's coming to take stuff from your facility uh, you know, is operating at a, a certain level to be able to, to work with that. Um, but, but that's really the, the, only, the only restriction there is just around, uh, around having businesses being, being participants. Okay, okay. So in, we'll move on in just a second, but it's your your company Reapley really manages sustainability and circular economies across whatever size of business you have so 
start out as a startup, as you scale, you know, it's kind of like having a partner who's right along with you the whole way. That's, that's fascinating. This has got to be very helpful. Yeah, I love it. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else or doing any kind of work. Um, it's, it's fun also like putting on the different hats of, you know, one day, um, you know, this strange material matchmaker, Cupid doing work with weird, obscure waste streams that, that nobody else wants to touch. Um, you know, and then the next day taking, you know, getting to take this super active role and, you know, really helping a new and emerging, uh, economy grow before our eyes. Um, and, and yeah, all of that's so, so cool. It's fascinating work. Okay. Last, definitely not least, uh, we have Beth. And I have a couple questions, but I want to start off with what are some of the new things that the Cuyahoga County Waste Department, Waste District has been working on? Um, we've been working on a, a couple of things. Um, we try to change, you know, people's behaviors to get them to be aware of the things that your the prior speakers have talked about. And as that, um, we have launched um, a new grant program and it's, it's pointed primarily to communities that, that service residents. Um, it can be for nonprofits and it can be for institutions um, to have them think kind of outside the box. This grant is a, a larger dollar amount grant. Uh, there's $50,000 available in the pool annually. And to try and, and get those entities to you know, embrace taking those next steps to make those changes. Um, for example, um, last year was our launch of this grant and we had a, a community on the west side who has been trying to deal better with the cardboard that is generated from within their community. And we gave them a grant which helped purchase a compactor so what they could do is they could take into control of marketing those materials themselves. So, um, you know, they had been educating, you know, businesses and the public on to, again, the, the points of your prior speakers. Um, we need to, to have people understand that these are resources. These are commodities. It's not trash. It, it's not, you know, the old adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, they're all treasures. And what we need to do is care for them that way. And then that way they are available someone else's feedstock down the road. Um, so that is one thing we are doing. We are also working with the Ohio EPA, uh, specifically on a cardboard project, again, um, Speaking of the circular economy, we have more of a demand for cardboard in the Midwest than we do source. And we need to tap those medium sized to small sized businesses, make them aware. Um, as a society, we've, we've gotten to this point where we're, we're so wasteful. We are just such a throwaway. Um, unlike a few generations ago, where everything it was a resource. You know, you, you didn't throw away a mason jar. Um, you used it for canning or you used it for a drinking glass. You know, you just, you know, again, all those things became another resource. We weren't as wasteful. And um, we are working to try and get into those smaller businesses and medium-sized businesses what we do is we actually will go in and do a waste audit for those companies. We'll go in and dumpster dive and be able to say, okay, of this whole pie that you are getting rid of, um, you know, we can identify overruns or we can identify materials that can immediately get to market. Or we will ask questions kind of like what Daniel was saying is, you know, what is this material? Let's get you. And we do send a lot of people to the Ohio um, materials marketplace. Don't throw this away. You know, you know this could be someone else's um, usable product down the line. Um, and again, we're trying to, to 
you know, educate people on the things that you are throwing away could be either reused, um, they could be recycled, they need to be treated as such. And, um, and oh, by the way, look at the beginning of your process, what might you be able to reduce right from the get go. So um, we are working on that cardboard pro project to get into businesses, look at those things, um, and see if we can't generate more cardboard. Uh, we have a huge paper mill in the Wapakoneta area. Um, actually, when it comes to, to, I'm gonna go on a tangent here for a moment. When it comes to cardboard, yes. um, it, being in the Midwest is a wonderful thing. Uh, we actually have eight existing paper mills in, the, in seven states in the Midwest. We are the, the largest seat of that production. And what's wonderful to know is all of those now use recycled material. Um, they aren't sourcing virgin any longer, which is just a wonderful thing to be able to say. We have two more paper mills, one in um, Kentucky and one in Tennessee coming online. So again, we can get those materials back in, you know, remanufactured. And, and one of the things um, as the prior speakers have talked about is um, trying to get those products to the highest and best use with cardboard in particular or paper products. Every time you process it, it does unfortunately fall to a lower use and everything eventually ends up becoming toilet paper um, simply through the manufacturing process, the fibers get shorter and shorter. But, um, you know, getting that material back in there um, and along those same lines, we've been trying to develop better uses and collection methodologies for glass. Speaking of the most recyclable material that we, yeah, that we have, um, you know, two decades ago, that was, that was your container material, um, you know, and, and trying to get a processing facility sited in the Northern part of the state. There's a processing facility for glass recycling in the Southern part but due to things like transportation, which becomes very expensive, and we don't want to have all those diesel trucks belching down the highway to Dayton anyhow, trying to get those processing facilities more local so we can get that material collected, get it remanufactured, and glass has no degradation. It can be, yes, it can be recycled over and over again into to new products, whether it's a, a beverage or, you know, beverage bottle or fiberglass or things of that nature. So those are the projects that we're, we're really focusing on as, um, you know, was mentioned earlier, you know, to start a process, you want to look at the end. And the most important thing is making that end market infrastructure be viable to then get all of that material generated, get it to the proper sources for either reuse or recycling. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I kind of have a question for folks, if they don't mind. Um, I'm curious, Please. like, again, what you would see as the future of your industry. Um, I, I think all the time, like, yes, we have we have so many landfills. We've got so much stuff degrading. We're going to have to deal with forever chemicals. We're going to have to deal with regenerating our topsoil layers. Um, there's so much that we're going to need to address. And so in, in the future, um, like if your industry were supported with policy and with workforce programs and in, in an ideal world, like what would your, in, what would it look like for you? Producer responsibility. Yes, let's go. <laughs> Producer responsibility. It all, uh, um, I mean, we're in the situation we're in now because we need to make a product desirable and we, we you know i'm some there's even built-in obsolescence and things and you know you got to have the sizzle to sell and there's no thought to what occurs down the line and the ramifications thereof and um there are fine examples throughout the united states where you know on, at this at the state level there has been legislation passed to make those producers of different materials um, be responsible for when that item 
whether it's a TV or a computer, when it, it reaches its end of life, that there has to be a system in place to deal with it. So we're not dealing with forever chemicals or heavy metals. So th that, would, <laughs> that would be my wish is to have producer responsibility and just raise the consciousness of society in general to understand the entire cycle. You know, it, it really affects our, our future, our, our ability to be able to sustain as a society. I, if I could, I have nothing to take away from that. That was a fantastic answer. If I could add anything, I would say that as much as it's important for consumers to be responsible with their waste, a big portion of what consumers waste is less an option on their part and more of availability by the producer. And so just as important as having your individual consumers be responsible is having those who are making the products be responsible. Absolutely. Something to piggyback on that <clears throat> is Please. one of the big reasons we can't have nice things is because of money and politics. <clears throat> and you know who defeats bottle bills every single time? Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, um, et cetera. And so that's what, like, so um, I think what, like if I, if I could wave a magic wand and have better policy, I would get money out of politics and I would limit the size of corporations. I would take a, uh, you know, I think the Amish have an interesting idea where they limit the size of a congregation to 250 people. And if you get to 250 people, you have to start a new congregation. So if you're, in my opinion, some of the most evil stuff happens because it be, it's it's way over there and it's it's so abstracted and balanced. It's on the balance sheet. It's on the, it's a cash flow decision, and the people that are making these financial decisions don't have to don't encounter any people that are actually affected by their decisions. And if hmm. if all the if all of your decisions, you know, if if you get to go home to Hunting Valley and you sit in an office in a key tower or something. Um, you know, and you don't know anyone that actually uh, has to live with the downstream effects of your choices. It's a lot more easy to make um, unintentionally evil decisions. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to bring up Ismail for being on this call again. Thank you for being on the front lines of that. You know. Show, showing us what a new future might look like. <laughs> no, like I think it's like the, that, that kid's book we all read, the Lorax, like biggering and biggering and biggering. I mean, we know what it is and it's not going to be fixed until, right? So I think we know what to do. It's just a choice. Like, again, humans are, we're in control of our own destiny. And if we see opportunities and we don't jump in to support each other and help, and we actually hear a pathway to jump in and like actually do something that will be impactful, then we're all culpable. Like, you know, it's like I, part of it is like I left East Cleveland and I was part of a brain drain, right? So I'm, what, what role do I play in, the, in, in, in East Cleveland being what it is? So I'm back. Right, dealing with that reality, and so my 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 ask of everybody, my, myself, is like, what are we doing? Right, we can't continue. I mean, with respect to all the efforts, it's just like when I was when I was in Boston, like I had a lot of opportunity to work with some very powerful institutions, and we were in a circular conversation about what could happen because of the powerful institutions that we were actually navigating with. They were leveraging our our melanin, they were leveraging our sustainability efforts just so they could begin to talk about, you know, them doing really good jobs. And so for me, it's like restarting from scratch, finding the places that you have the most opportunity, what, what places are big enough and small enough to actually see immediate impact with the investment that's needed to actually create something that's circular and lasting. And if we don't do that, then it's on us. And I think that there are places, uh, obviously I'm advocating for East Cleveland, uh, that you can actually put sound investment into that doesn't have to be status quo investment because we know that you know economic development strategies lead to very predictable results 
hiring people at low wages, looking for mature businesses. Those mature businesses usually are extractive in nature. They're looking at a bottom line, and that bottom line usually comes from unprincipled decisions that affect our planet and people. And until we actually create scalable businesses that affect our community in a different way with a financial benefit that can actually create payback, and we know that there's $160 billion a year industry that's in the food waste space, it just in general, globally, and we're allowing for 60%, 40, 45% of the, of the food that is grown to go to waste and not creating sound business models in places that you can actually have a, a, a low barrier to entry, then we're choosing to continue to invest in, 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 in a reality that's not going to generate anything different. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think it's really like the choices that we make. It's all possible. Um, and there's policies, there's dollars, there's statewide dollars, federal dollars, county dollars to actually invest in communities in real way. And so the question is, how do we put together the stacks? How do we not make, how do we not just look at the parameters? How many jobs are you going to bring in? How old is your business? Because that's who gets the monies first. And those businesses that are at scale to get the sizable revenue, uh, the sizable capital investments usually are the ones that are the people that we're arguing about doing the bad thing. So we have to create a pathway for communities to actually hold the power and dollars in land to actually build for ourselves and not rely on an extractive economy. So that's what I think. Mic drop. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a fantastic answer. We're coming up on the last couple of minutes and I did wanna hear it from Daniel one more time. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Daniel. Yeah, now now I've got to follow that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, huge, yeah, huge, huge plus one to everything that was that was just said. Like, and, and maybe the only the only addition to to all this great thought um, is that I, I think, in addition to making things better, in addition to supporting our local economies, all of all of this, we as a society buy too much stuff and and we have to get to a new way of of thinking where we start to curb our our overconsumption. Uh, there you know, it only goes so far to make things in a in a better way um but but we also have to slow down on the amount of things that that we're making the amount of things that we're buying the amount of things that we're using and the amount of things that we're eventually sending the landfill like that 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 has to happen. We have to we have to uh, condense the 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 amount of things that are going into the system. Um, I I get really excited about that because I think that that is where we get to start talking about this whole exciting new world of possibility for businesses to support keeping things that are already in the system in the system longer. Um, and I, I think there's just so much excitement to be had around thinking about repair, thinking about things that are adding longevity, adding lifespan to things around us, um, and, and truly building a new, a new economy around, uh, around these services, around these businesses that are, uh, you know, helping us use less things over time. Thank you. Um, we are right up against seven o'clock right now. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything else to add we are about to cut off the recording pretty soon. Uh, after this, there's going to be about 15 minutes where I'm going to stay on. I believe Courtney will be here with me. Um, I'm asking that the panelists please stay. If there's any questions from the audience, that, that'll be when we accept them. Uh, please, we, we would love questions about sustainability. Um, we sent out just a little bit earlier um, some questions for all the panelists. We ask that you have an answer for those or write an answer to those questions because we're going to be using them for a publication that's coming on. I believe if you see Charlotte in the yeah, Charlotte in the um, view, she'll be writing a story on behalf of Freshwater Cleveland. Uh, she's very well experienced in English and I'm, I'm very confident in her skills. So without further ado, any questions from the audience? Not much of an audience, I guess. We'll be 
will be watching later. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody at seven o'clock. Uh, Courtney, if you could please end the recording.